Well, welcome back to another episode of Virginia is for Realtors. I am joined today by Deanna Beltran, who is the broker for Ulta Realty. Deanna, how are you today? I'm doing great, Tanner. How are you? I am doing outstanding. We got some rainy weather, so it was a good day to have a podcast because I'm not going to be out on a golf course and we're not really enjoying this outside. But let's do a podcast. Sounds great to me. Let's do it. Well, I have been kind of tracking how you are doing. And to be very honest, I am impressed. You seem to be kind of uh, not coming out of nowhere, but your trajectory is really impressive. So before we get into all that, let's talk about how you got into the business, what you were doing before. Give me the rundown of everything. All right. Well, I started out actually doing temporary leasing for a local mall in Colonial Heights when okay. I was about 17. So doing their leasing, things like that. And I realized then that I really enjoyed real estate. And as life turns, you know, I then headed into the insurance field. I did that for 15 and a half years through property and casualty and life and health. And then I kind of dabbled in personal property management for a apartment complex. Okay. Did that for several long years and then went back <laughs> into insurance and then said, you know, I did this for another 11 years. That's a long time to be in the insurance field. And that is kind of my background as well. My father owns an insurance agency where I'm from in Kenwick, Washington. So it can be very lucrative, but I often feel with insurance, it's a, it's a large build to get to that point. Unlike with our profession, where we are paid a handsome amount up front. Hopefully we're going to see the people again when they sell or buy down the road, but it's definitely a different sales model for a way to put it. It is. However, gaining those and keeping those relationships are still a lot of the same. Yes. And I do want to talk to you about that. So now you didn't grow up in this area. So when did you move to Fredericksburg area? So I moved to Stafford, Fredericksburg area in 2002. Okay. And then were you doing the insurance and that part in this area here? Yes, okay. I was. I actually started insurance when I moved here. It was probably right around 2003. So that kind of answers now you getting into the business and really came down to you were going to follow your passion for something that you want to do. What was your first steps? Like, what was the thing that you said, you know what, this is it. I'm going to do this, the catalyst for you to make it happen. I had lots of friends through the years that had been in real estate. I'd help them out here and there behind the scenes with paperwork and filing and getting move-in gifts ready and that sort of thing. So I really enjoyed a lot of the, the little things that went on behind the scenes. And that's kind of where I actually started dabbling, you know, outside of leasing. Okay. And then I was like, you know, when my kids get older, I would love to do this. And then I had suffered a financial hardship myself due to a loan that I had got into back in 2005 <laughs> when the market went crazy. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to help people. I want to make sure that they're making the right choices and really understand what they're getting themselves into. So a lot of it really played into me wanting to be a realtor. I enjoyed the real estate side. I really wanted to help people. And that's how I kind of got here and just through helping friends with their businesses. Okay. Makes sense. So when did you actually get your license? I actually got my real estate license about three and a half years ago. Wow. Okay. It'll be four years in March. It goes by fast. That is the it one does. thing that, about this business is that if you blink, you'll be in 10 years. That's generally yes. just how this happens. So especially if you are a producing realtor or producing loan officer, the months kind of roll over and that's just how it goes. So we go very... by 30 to 45 day increments. <laughs> that's so. right. That's right. <laughs> Well, very good. So you got your license roughly three and a half years ago. Tell me about what led you to decide you wanted to become the broker because to go that quickly is very impressive. Well, I've never sat still long anywhere. I've always wanted more for myself, more for my family and always push myself to do better and set goals for myself. Mm -hmm. I never really, honestly, if I must speak transparently, I never had the ambition to be the, the broker of Ulta. I wanted to open up my own brokerage and open up my own company. I had already had it S Corped and my own logo and my own name. And I just hadn't put that to work yet, if you okay. were to say. Right before I went to put it to work, the owners of Ulta came to me and said that the current broker that was with us was kind of going her own way and asked me if I wanted to be broker. So that is how all of that started rolling. And that's how I'm here today. Gotcha. So which is harder, becoming a realtor or becoming a broker? 
the test for the broker was definitely harder. Okay. I think they're both challenging in their own ways because I still do sell and do the real estate side and the broker side. I think I like doing the broker side a little bit better because you're really helping the agents and, and molding them. As far as harder, I would have to say the realtor side. Gotcha. There's a lot to keep up with and just making sure that you're negotiating and doing right by your clients when you have multiple clients. I would say that was harder if I have to choose one. Gotcha. Okay. I ended up getting my broker's license kind of a similar time frame that you did. I had been a loan officer. I started in August, 2003. And by October of 2006, I had my broker's license. I was kind of like you. I wanted to be off on my own. I wanted to run the show. And if I had been tapped similar to Ulta Realty, there's probably a good chance I'd be doing that. And uh, that's just kind of how I did it on my end. It's awesome. Well, yes, thank you. And, you know, congratulations to you on, on getting it done so quickly. Because a lot of people talk about it for years and years and years, and they never do. And, you know, you're just like, no, I'm going to get it done. That's what I, I'm going to do this now. Let me ask you this. You know, when you got into the business and you were around realtors before, what was one of the bigger misconceptions you had about what realtors do, what they don't do that you saw? And now you're like, oh, I, I didn't even think about that. So making my own schedule. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that, shall we? So when I came into this business, you know, oh, you'll get to make your own schedule. It's great. So yeah, that, that's not the case. You work 24 seven. You all have to be available Monday through Friday from nine to five when all banks and home inspectors and, in, and everyone, title companies are open. Mm -hmm. And then your clients don't get off work till five. For, so evenings and weekends is for your clients and showing homes and if you really want to be a successful agent and a, a busy agent, then you have to work when your clients are available and when the title companies are available and the mortgage companies are available. So it is, yes, you get to make your own schedule. However, it is not what you think it is. <laughs> right. It, it, you, know, you may be choosing activities that aren't going to help you get paid next week. So you kind of have to make sure you're setting realistic time frame to do work. And then you certainly need to leave yourself some time to quote unquote play, but you do have yes. to put in the work. It's not just going to fall into your lap. Uh, I completely understand that. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk about your first year as a real estate agent. I want to hear about kind of your first sales, some of the things that you're still doing today that you did when you started back then and all that good stuff. So we'll be right uh -huh. back with Deanna Beltran with Ulta. We're back with Deanna and we are going to go and talk about that first year in real estate for you because a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this podcast are brand new agents. They're looking to get their first deal done. They're completing their first year. So tell me about your first transaction. Was it a purchase? Was it a sale? What did you do first? It was a purchase. Okay. So how did you find the client? What, what were some of the steps that you went into doing to getting the client? When I first got my license, I used social media a lot because it was inexpensive and it reached all of my family and friends. And I just oh. started reaching out to them. So my first client was actually a family member. Perfect. Okay. So you put a post on there that said, Hey everybody, I'm a new agent here to help you with your real estate needs. And somebody said, Oh, I'm looking to buy a house. Is that kind of how that went? Kind of how it went. Yeah. A couple months later. Okay. Very nice. You're working with your first client. Now, what are some of the things that when you're brand new that you know now that are just second nature, but when you first started, you were, you were a little hesitant about, or you didn't quote unquote do correctly. What were some of those? The right to represent. I didn't get that signed right away. I knew I needed to, but I was having a little bit of a problem going into how to lock them in as clients, even though they were family, it was hard getting over that hump to have that discussion. The other thing would be making sure that the numbers on the contract make sense. Like if you have a 30 day close, you don't want to wait to have the home inspection done 21 days after a ratification <laughs> day, you know, just making sure it all makes sense because when it's your first contract, you're nervous and you're wanting to make sure it's perfect. And sometimes you overthink. Makes sense. Now you have your first client. How many houses did you look at ballpark? Was it a lot? Was it one or two? It was probably, we looked at 10 or so. And then they actually had found the one that they liked through a third party site and sent it to me. So. Okay. And do you find that happens a lot now in the industry where somebody kind of says, Hey, I want to go look at one, two, three main street. And you know, I saw it on Zillow or one of these other sites and, and then you're like, sure, let's do it. 
It does. Yeah. I guess that is some of the benefits of those particular sites, but obviously we want to keep the client off of them as much as possible. I would say, honestly, very true. Uh, they should be receiving the listings from the agent to be checking those houses because as everybody knows, that information is not always up to date. And I've had multiple times where, you know, one of the things I do for my clients is if you're going to go show them houses and they want to know what a particular payment is going to be on a property before they go look at it, I'm happy to crunch the numbers for them. So they shoot me a text with, hey, what's uh, 123 Main Street? And I figure out the payment for them. Well, where I go is I'm going to go check Zillow or I'm going to go check one of these other sites. And when I go there and you see it says pending, like, hey, that one's off the table. So, you know, that's that's a reason you need to be with your agent getting the most updated information ASAP and viewing the property. Yep, makes sense. So your first year into the business, you know, let's finish off your first sale. So it's a purchase. Were there any hiccups along the way that were some learning experiences that you're like, ah, oh, I wish I had that one over or how'd that go? Well, uh, the actual whole transaction went pretty flawlessly up till the closing table. I will put myself out there. I think it's pretty funny, but yeah, I forgot the keys. For okay. Closing. So yeah, that was really the only hiccup throughout the entire transaction. Luckily there was a code on the door. So we were able to go after closing to get the keys that way. And my clients had no clue. I totally played it off. Just right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good that they're family too. And I bet that happens to so many more agents than they're willing to admit. Kudos to, to you for, for being able to tell the truth. It happens hey, I'm all. human. I'm hey, human. <laughs> you know, I've heard of agents driving away with the, the key from the lockbox and then being told, hey, they're going to need that back. And uh, so all these things kind of happen for sure. They do. They so do. first deal goes smooth. All right. I was a family member. You have that success and that feeling of getting the first one done. What were your steps after you closed the first one? How am I going to get two, three, four? What were you doing to make that happen? I started marketing into the neighborhood that I had sold the home in. I started sending postcards out. And in order to make that actually work for you, you have to stay pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. So I was doing it every three months, staying in front of them. I had a couple of calls, but actually didn't sell anymore in that neighborhood. Okay, gotcha. Do you feel that a lot of times too, even if the activity isn't producing the results that you're looking for, it's the momentum that is going to lead to the next one. As long as you come up with an idea, you try the idea, if it doesn't work right away and, and you move on the next one, but if you are not consistently doing an activity and you're just waiting, that's not going to do it. It's not. Because you never know if someone's family member had mentioned they pulled out your postcard and said, hey, call this person. So, you know, some of the listings that I got there afterwards might have came from it. I don't know, but it wasn't in that actual neighborhood. Makes sense. Okay. Momentum is very important. Yes, I, I think so as well. So you closed your first one. How quickly was it for your next one after that? Um, it was probably about two and a half months. Okay. You stayed committed to, all right, I was able to get the first one done. We're going to get this to happen. And you just have to stay consistent on whatever you're doing. I see, you know, being a friend of yours on Facebook and a friend, I see a lot of social media posts that were you doing the same activities in that first year? Or a lot of like, hey, I'm, I'm going to stay consistent on my social media. I was doing many more lives than what I am now. Okay. Um, I was going live at other people's listings with, of course, their permission within my brokerage, just letting people know, hey, I'm here. Because if people don't know what you do, they don't know to contact you for their needs. And then I got my second deal, which was an actual listing, which was actually a luxury home listing. Oh, wow. Okay. Tell me about that transaction. It was actually also another family member. It was listed at 1.1. We ended up closing at 950,000. Okay. Awesome. Every buyer was happy. Seller was happy. It worked out well. That one was a little more complicated. Personalities were different. There was many, many negotiations over everything from home inspection items to price, which I learned a lot from that deal. That's a good question I was going to ask you. It's, it seems like to me, a lot of times you are going to learn more on harder deals than you ever will on a nice, smooth transaction. Uh, unfortunately, I wish it was the other way around, but we, we learned the, the hardest uh, <laughs> lessons on the hard ones for sure. It is very true. You got that listing done, got that listing sold. And now you're through your first year. At what point were you saying to yourself, you know what? I really love what I'm doing, that this is going to be what I'm going to do either the rest of my life or for the next 25 years, I'm going to make this a career. 
It was definitely after my first year. What many don't know is that I was still at the insurance agency oh, okay. my first year in real estate. I was still 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and doing the mom thing and the wife thing and doing real estate full time, not wow. part time, full time. Okay. Uh, so it was a lot, but it wasn't anything that I you know, hadn't done before because I went to college late in life and was doing full-time college. I just rolled it over to real estate. At the point of my, I would say my third transaction, my third transaction was actually a rental. And after my third transaction, I actually knew this is where I belong. This is what my passion is. And I gave my insurance agency that I've been with for over 11 years that are now like family, my notice. And I gave them like a two or three months notice. I told them in March, like the beginning of March, and I was gone by May 3rd. Wow. I'm sure that was a, a hard decision to make to an extent, uh, especially the relationship you'd had there and been there a long time, but obviously a great decision that you made. Now in that first year, what are some of the things that you still do now that you did that first year? Follow up with my clients, follow okay. up with every lead that I get. I make sure I check on their families. That's what this business is about. It's about relationships and about the people. It's not really about the money. Of course, you know, you're here to make a living for your family, but if you only do it for the money, that's as far as you're ever going to go. Right. And, it's and the it, people. And I think that leads to burnout too, if it's just about the money, because then there are a lot of things in our industry that you're going to not like as you're going along. And then sooner or later, it's not worth the check that you're getting, whether it's the dealing with the client or whatever. So loving what you're doing, helping the clients, that's certainly an important part of what you've grown your business. And that's a good point. You know, I, I know you to be more social and outgoing than everybody, myself included. Thank you. If, I, that's a huge advantage to an extent, but also that's great that when you're contacting your past clients, let's talk about that a little bit, because I've started doing that more where I'm reaching out to my past clients, not so much with, hey, are you looking to purchase or sell when I'm calling you right in the beginning or refinance or whatever, but how's the new house treating you? How's the family? Things like yeah. that. And I find that conversation, it, it may start slow, but it, it really builds from there where I've learned all kinds of things from my clients. So let's talk a little bit about that. What is your time frame when you call them back after a settlement? Things like that. I usually check on them after the first week just okay. to make sure they don't have any questions about something in the house, how it operates. I make sure that they know that I'm there for them after the closing. Like I'm not just here through the transaction closing, like I'm here for you after. And so I will follow up with them about a week after. And then it's about every three months. And that's just to say, hey, how are you and about the kids? Most of the time, I don't even talk about anything real estate. I don't even bring it up at the end because it's not really why I'm calling. I am just calling to make sure that their family's good, that they're so happy with the home. And that's about the gist of the real estate that I talk to them about. It's and then, fun. you know, in like the six months, I definitely call and say, hey, and it's more of a real estate call. Gotcha. And have you found though, even on those initial first calls that you make, oh, by the way, I, I gave your name to a friend. They're getting ready to purchase in the spring or whatever the situation is. Have you gotten that response from the client? I have. Yeah. Okay. I've also had people call me and say, hey, so-and-so sent me your way, and I'm trying to wreck my brain on who that actually is, and it wasn't actually a client of mine. It was a client that referred a family member that hadn't worked with me yet, but they referred their friend. Wow. Okay. So word of mouth is huge. For sure. In the coaching program that I'm a part of, one of the things they stress is on Wednesdays to reach out to your past clients, and how they do it is they call two letters of the alphabet every week. So if I contact A and B this week, next week is C and D and you kind of keep moving. So you're going to have that basically a quarterly phone call with your clients to discuss kind of what's going on in their family. And, you know, one of the things I found that's been helpful is when I reach out to clients, it seems like a lot of people are having babies. So I've been sending out some, some baby care packages as oh, a, that's a good idea. way to put them. And, you know, it's $50 or whatever the number is just to send it to them. And that's showing them you're not just a transaction, obviously we want to keep your business, but Hey, congratulations on the new baby. So if you're listening to this podcast, that's a good idea that I recommend when you contact somebody, something like that. That's an awesome idea. All right. First year you've now decided I'm going to make this my career. When did you personally start setting goals for what you want to do in business? From the very beginning. From the very beginning. And do you remember kind of what goals in that kind of first year time frame? My first year, even though I was at the insurance company still, my goal was to make enough 
to pay my portion of the bills for that year okay. without touching the insurance money. Gotcha. That's a great goal because it's basically, this is how much I need to make. Here's how I'm going to do it. And you, you even had a dollar figure that you were looking for, which a lot of times people set a goal. It's not really a goal that has steps in place to get there. It's how am I going to do it? So you said, this is what I want to do. And that is my first goal. Now, do you set goals every year for yourself or how do you do that? I do. I set goals for myself every year in November. Okay. Um, I start to see where I am in the current year. Okay. And then I then look at where do I want to be the following year? Do I want to be double the income? What is my goal? And that's what I figure out so that by December, I already know what I need to do to start putting in motion and putting out into the universe to make the numbers happen in January. Yep. Makes sense. Well, great. Uh, Deanna, when we come back, we are going to talk about in this section, heading your strides. You've made it through your first year. You are now in year two. Uh, I know you had a tremendous year two. So I want to talk a little bit about that second year in business and when you really started pushing forward. We'll be right. right back with Deanna Beltran with Ulta Realty. All right. We're back with Deanna. And Deanna, I'd like to talk about a little bit, I call it hitting your stride. You've made it through that first year. You've decided that real estate is going to be your career. Let's talk about some of those things that you did in your second year to really start, you know, running. I was looking at your numbers for your second year and it looked like you killed it. I would put it mm -hmm. that way. Do you, were they, and I didn't notice this part, were they more purchases more, were they more listings? What were you seeing more of? It was a very good balance. Okay. I definitely had more of both my second year okay. Um, because the word of mouth really started to spread, which is huge. My online presence had increased. So my second year really took off. Okay. The second year is growing and, and I assume you're still doing your Facebook live posts, your posts on social a lot. Is that where you're seeing a, a lot of the growth and people spreading the word as we've talked about where you would contact the clients? What was the avenue that you were getting these people? Mainly family and friends and okay. social media. My first and second year, I really didn't pay for a whole lot of advertising except writing pins. Okay. Believe it or not, people love them. And I would go to a restaurant and I would leave four. Yeah, I would leave four pins. And every time I ordered pizza, I gave them four pins. And that's kind of the gist of literally my marketing in my second year. Well, wow, that sounds like almost guerrilla marketing where you're, you're getting your name out there through alternative methods that don't cost thousands and thousands of dollars. No, because I had goals and, you know, my first year I was still an insurance agent, but I had that goal to pay my bills with that money. And then my second year, I no longer had that insurance job. So I had to make sure I was budgeting correctly. Now, have you been able to, from your previous career, bring some clients over that you knew from the insurance side? Absolutely. Okay. You know, I had been with that insurance group for, so I had developed many friendships with many of the clients there. So of course they knew I was leaving and where I was going. So yes, I've definitely used that um, platform for gaining clients as well. Gotcha. What are some of the things that you've noticed that, that have served you in the real estate field that they worked really well in the insurance field? social media, following up with your clients, making sure they understand what's going on and the policies and procedures alike. I mean, insurance and real estate kind of go hand in hand. So just keeping those connections with people, it's huge. Yeah. Makes sense. You're in, sec in your second year now. Have you personally ever hired a coach? I have not hired one. No, I actually had assisted one that I had met at a continuing education class. She needed some help with a couple of our continuing education classes. So I kind of exchanged my services of helping her for her to assist me with a little bit of coaching, but I did not have a consistent coach. We had two meetings and she was a great help. Okay. Gotcha. I know you're the broker now in, at, at Ulta. Do you coach a lot of your agents? Is that kind of where your role is now too? I do. I created trainings for them from beginning to end, from contracts to the software that we use to the end marketing, lots and lots of training for them, because if they don't have that foundation, it's hard to get to the next level. Yep, for sure. And then that leads me to a good question. You know, when I went into your office, one of the things I was really impressed with is you are growing a team quickly of, of newer agents. 
And so you're seeing a lot of what these next questions are. What are some of the, the things that you see in a first year agent or a new agent that are mistakes that you would say to the person listening to this, these are things to be on the lookout for? Being too nervous to make that first initial approach to someone to say, hey, do you want to sell a buyer house? You have to be able to talk to people. You can't sit there and expect people just to come to you. You have to get out there. You have to let people know what you do. Talk to people in the grocery store and go live on your Facebook. I know it's uncomfortable and out of your comfort zone. This here, this podcast is out of my comfort zone just a little. I am okay going live with friends and family on Facebook, but never done this before. So I try to lead by example. So that's definitely what I would tell them. Go live. So don't have any reservations or you need to get over your fears. I think that anybody starting the business, you have to understand, yes. and because I have new loan officers that start for me as well, that you are going to fail in some things. You just need to get comfortable that that's going to happen. It's not going to be perfect every time, but no. you shouldn't expect it to be. And if you're expecting the perfect real estate transaction or loan, unfortunately, that's not how it's going to go. So because no. the, the, the mistakes you're going to make, you'll learn from those mistakes and move forward. But I definitely get this a lot too, of going live on social, getting your name out there and just let go of your reservations. So yes. if you're a new agent, so what are some of the things that the new agents should be talking about on their video? They need to be one, giving people a little bit of their background. Two, they need to make sure that they are Allowing people to know them for who they are. Don't try to pretend to be another person. Like be who you are. People really will gravitate to that because then they will trust you to know that you are a real person. Makes sense. That second year, at some point, the phone probably wasn't ringing as much as you wanted it to. You have a moment where you're kind of like, wait a minute, why am I don't have three buyers in the pipe and two listings coming this way? So when you have that moment, what are the activities that you do right away to, I'm going to get this phone ringing? Start reaching out to past clients. Okay. Start going live more. I know I keep saying it with like, like, that is the meat and potatoes of my business. The third thing was doing pop buys, not only to previous clients, but also just my entire neighborhood. And it could have been something as simple as a bag of popcorn and, you know, or a balloon and a wine glass, just something to say, Hey, I'm here. Yeah. Just putting yourself out there. Also, I have been known to just walk around a random neighborhood on a good spring day when everyone's out walking their dogs and their kids <laughs> and just talking to people. I think that's the biggest thing that you can do is, is like you said, talk to people. They're not going to tell you to go away. You're not a marketing phone call. You're just, Hey, just asking questions, putting yourself out there seems to be the biggest thing that I would take from that for sure. And also to go talk to your local builders. That is a marketing avenue that I have really enjoyed. They want to talk to you just as much as you want to talk to them because they want you to bring people to their properties. So just having that network, you know, sometimes they have someone that comes in that doesn't have an agent and that really wants one. And then they will give three or four names that they have worked with in trust or that they see regularly. And that's how I also gained more clients as well. And when you have a client to work with and they're maybe not finding something uh, on the existing sales side and everything they're telling you, you're like, you know what? This builder has what you're looking for. Let's go talk to them. Yes, because you get familiar with their floor plans and the type of lots that they build on and you can really help your clients better if you know what the builders offer ahead of time. Outstanding. When you're working with new agents that are joining your team, and I, I don't know if you've had anybody that didn't work out, but what are some of the things that you notice when an agent isn't going to make it? What are some of the things they do? They make excuses. They will have every excuse in the book on why they can't obtain a goal or why they can't find clients. You know, when I call in particular, one comes to mind and I'm like, hey, what are you up to? Oh, I'm just drinking coffee. Oh, are you at the coffee shop to meet people? Because I also would do that. I put like a logo on the back of my computer that says I list, I sell, I close. And then, you know, you go and you have a cup of coffee, you open your laptop, look busy. You know, busy people make things happen. Nope, she's in her backyard drinking a cup of tea. Well, go to the coffee shop, go meet people. And she just couldn't get past that comfort zone of meeting people. 
So you have to get out of your own way and put yourself out there. Unless you have a ton of family and a ton of friends, <laughs> it is not going to work. As, as many people who are transient to this area as there are, not everybody's going to have a ton of friends and family around here. Right. I'm, my, I'm from Washington State. I didn't know anybody when I headed out this way. So that's not going to work for, for myself when I started in the business. That's funny. I came up with roughly 20 guerrilla marketing ideas <laughs> when I started as a new loan officer. And everything from going to talking to car dealers, like, hey, if you guys, you're trying to make a deal work and they need to refinance, like, here's my number. That's smart. You know, just trying to think of different things, whether it was uh, a real estate book. I think I left my business cards at the in Barnes and Noble and the library. <laughs> So I came up with 20 that I wanted to try. I don't know if any of them really worked, but it, it was worth the effort and the motivation to, to keep trying something different. It was that momentum. Momentum. Let's talk about that. When What do you see as the momentum piece when it starts just like building on itself and, and you just keep it rolling? What are some of the activities that are leading to that that you see agents doing? Staying consistent, not making excuses putting in the work, making sure that you are out in your community too. When you start gaining that momentum and people are starting to know who you are, now you can really get out there and do like community service. Make sure that you're involving yourself in those things as well. And that's going to lead you to more people and you're still doing good for your community. That way you can build on that momentum in a different way. Would you recommend to a new agent that they get not necessarily their car wrapped, but you know, their information on the back of the car? Have you known agents that have done that and it's worked for them? I, I do know agents that have done that. I think that's a personal choice. I don't have signs on my car. I have previously with other businesses that I've had, it's just a personal preference. So to have your phone number and your name on your car, I think it's great marketing because everyone sees it. But sometimes, you know, maybe I might do an illegal U-turn and I don't want them <laughs> to know who's in the car. <laughs> Valid point. Uh you know, I mean, sometimes when you're in an area you don't know too well, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> well, especially you guys, because you're driving around everywhere on streets you might not have been on before and showing yeah. houses that are off the side of a cliff and driveways that go into the middle of nowhere. So I can completely understand that. A valid point. Maybe I don't need my name on the back of that. Yeah. And I haven't done any illegal U-turns, but there have been moments where I've had to pull in people's driveways because I literally am lost and my GPS is searching. And I don't really want them to know that I'm a realtor lost. Like that's not a good look. I understand that completely. As a loan officer, when we bust out the calculator for simple math and people kind of think, shouldn't you know this? <laughs> like, yes, I should know this, but I'm just double checking because exactly. I'm not here to guess on this one. So, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the lead generation, the you becoming a broker, just different things that you're doing right now to get more business. We'll be right, right back with Deanna Beltran with Ulta Realty. We're back with Deanna. And so Deanna, let's talk a little bit about lead generation. And the first question I have for you is tell me about some of the programs or things that you're, you're using on a daily basis to get more clients. There's two that comes to mind. One is Ladies of Real Estate. This is a great um, product. It's not that expensive. It's usually about $20, $25 per month. Okay. Uh, they give you templates to create marketing material for your social media. You can also do flyers. They have blog ideas. There's a calendar in there that gives you each day what you should be doing for marketing for social media. A lot of useful tools there, and it's not that expensive to use. So it basically is giving you the template of these are the times you should be posting. This is the content you should be posting, things like that. Exactly. Yes. Very nice. Okay. And then you just enter your pictures and your information, changes and post it. Now, where does that go to? What are the different sites that puts it on? It's actually, you download it after you do the template, you save it to your desktop and then you go and place it wherever you want it. Okay. You can send it out in an email. You can put it on Facebook, Instagram, anywhere that you want. Okay, perfect. So that's a good one to use every day on the cheaper end because a lot of times new agents have already spent a good amount of dollars to get it's, into the it's business. It's a lot, yes. <laughs> and for sure. Well, how about another program that you use a lot? I would have to say HomeSnap. Okay. It has different features that you can pay for, but I actually use the free version and it's where you can invite your prospect buyers and your buyers to look at homes. And it updates real time with the MLS and it has your picture and your contact information as the agent. 
and then they can favorite their the properties that they like and also message you on there as well. That leads me to a good question for you. So when an agent has lost a client, the clients ghosted them or they just haven't stayed in touch, what are the things they did wrong? Why did they lose that client? It could be a couple of reasons. Um, one, they found out a, that a family member or friend was a real estate agent and decided, oh, well, let me use them. Or that agent that they were using didn't follow up enough or didn't give them enough information and they were still confused and they didn't feel like that agent was a good fit. And one of the things I, I come across in, in interviewing top producers like yourself is that the communication piece is so important because you're breaking down a complex process into understandable pieces and, and the same for loans, the same for real estate. So let's say, let's say I'm your client and I say to you, Deanna, I'm looking to buy, we're in October. I'm looking to buy in uh, April. How often are you going to be touching base with me? How are you going to be staying in front of me? All that good stuff. Well, I would always ask the upfront questions like, how is your credit? Just to see if they're going to need any credit repair before April. If they're wanting to buy in that time frame, we need to start now if they need help. And a lot of times I'll reach out to my lenders, such as yourself, to kind of help get them there beforehand. And that's huge in prepping them to be able to buy. Like, hey, these are the things you need to start working on now. If they're very confident that their credit's fine, I'll ask them if they have a house to sell. If they have a house to sell, then I will start coaching and prepping them on what they should start working on on the house. And staying in front of them at least every two to three weeks. Just like, hey, did you talk to Tanner? Um, where are you at with your credit repair? Okay, hey, did you repair that roof on the house yet? You know, it's going to get here before you know it. Staying in front of them and letting them know and telling them I'm here every step of the way from the beginning to the end and just really preparing them for what they, they need to do and put in place. I am a big planner. So a plan in place is huge in every aspect of real estate. And for the new agents out there, as you're talking about staying in front of them for every two or three weeks, has a client ever said to you, I got a Deanna, I'll call you in April. I'm actually kind of surprised at that because normally I would say most people that I've run into that are just like, okay, great. And then you're just staying in front of them. But you have had clients say, don't worry, you'll hear from me in April. You will. And I've only had maybe, it's not very often, maybe two. Okay. I was like, okay, well, I know where you're at when I'm ready. Okay, not a problem. You know where I'm at. You know, and then it's still, you know, I won't necessarily call them, but maybe I'll wait another month and it's just a slight email, but it won't be real estate related. But like, hey, I saw this and thought of you or something like that, just to still stay in front of them without pestering them, if you will. But a lot of people do like when you follow up because they know that you're going to follow up during the process if you're following up before you even start. I think that sets the tone because that goes back to the communication piece. And, you know, when you're doing the real estate transaction and you're in the middle of it, they become our best friends for that, that period of time. And it's up to you as a realtor. If you want to have them again in four or five years, you need to maintain that friendship and relationship. It's very true. And letting them know you're going to be there from start to finish, yeah. letting them know that sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And that's what you're there for to make sure that you educate them because knowledge is power. All of that's very important. And that makes people feel very comfortable when they know they have a knowledgeable agent that has experience. Yeah. So what are the, some of the bigger hurdles that you're seeing in the business right now? Well, it's, it's kind of in that sh weird shifting place. I feel like some houses are still selling pretty quickly. Other houses are staying on the market a little bit longer. And we're in this really weird time where the market value and what the appraisers are you know, wanting to appraise the properties at is kind of a little off. It's like, okay, we're still dealing with the contracts in, in some of the height of the market that are now appraising lower. And then, you know, then you try to use comps, but the market isn't exactly where the actual comps are. So it's in a really weird place right now of trying to come up with, you know, listing prices and things of that nature. I think it is kind of switching from a seller's market to a buyer's market, but it's still not totally a buyer's market. This is a market unlike anything we've seen before. I would agree with that because we don't know what the shadow inventory looks like with the forbearances. We have rates that are there. They haven't moved too much. I know a lot of people have been concerned that the rates are going up, but they will be at some point. It is a transitionary period that I feel personally that the good news is we're not going to have 
50 offers on a house this coming spring and summer. I would actually be surprised if we see that again, because I think more people are actually going to be listing on the market as we hopefully are coming out of COVID more full barrel, but I guess we'll see in some months here. So I want to end, you are the broker for Ulta Realty, and I would like to take the next 30 seconds, kind of give you a, a plug for why an agent listening to this should come over to you. Well, I know a lot of brokers would say, but we really are like a family here. We all really do help each other out when needed, you know, and give each other ideas. We work together at events. And Ulta, the owners, the owners are really what makes Ulta here. They invest so much into this brokerage and into their agents, especially for a newer agent coming into the field that has all of those dues to pay up front. Ulta provides just about everything for them except for those dudes. I mean, we provide signs, log boxes, their business cards, a shirt, a name tag. We pay for marketing for Ulta where they market themselves. All they have to do is show up and use the business cards, you know, Ulta paid for to market themselves. And the amount of training that's being put into place. And we call ourselves smarter real estate because we really are innovative and using lots of in-house programs and things like that to make the agent's job a little easier on them to free up more time so that they can be out in the field more. Ulta's owners really make this brokerage. They really care about us agents and spend lots of money in marketing and really care about our voice, which is huge. You know, and one of the things in, in talking to you before the podcast and being in your office to show the success that you're having, when you walked in the door as the broker, how many agents were under you? When I here is broker, mm -hmm. four, four. And from what I understand, where are you going to be like next month? We will have 10 to 12 agents. And, and when did you walk in the door as the broker? It was the end of June, beginning of July. And it took me a little while to get my feet wet. But I'm in basically to... three months, you have changed the culture at Ulta and are starting to recruit agents at a outstanding clip. And when I was in there, I could sense the team atmosphere, which was really impressive. So kudos to you for what you're doing and keep it up. Thank you. I would definitely call us the family. But another thing too, is that I definitely want to grow Ulta. But what I have stressed to each and every one of the new agents that have come here is I want quality in an agent. I am not looking for quantity at all. And quality does not mean highest salesperson. I'm looking for integrity and ethics and that big heart that really genuinely cares about people. That's what Ulta wants to build our brand and our business on. And so if there's anyone out there like that, that's looking for a brokerage that really prides himself on that, I really do think they could make Ulta their home. Well, outstanding. I think in closing and in, in recapping kind of our conversation, some of the things that stood out to me for, for the new agents out there is don't make excuses. It's not going to always be easy when you're in that first year, but excuses are, are not going to help you succeed. So figure out a way to get through the problem that you're having, rely on the people around you that have been doing it longer, that can help you. And the, the other thing too, that, that I really take from you and your time in the business is put yourself out there, talk to people, post on social, those things make a difference. And putting yourself out there and not always in your comfort zone has paid off handsomely for you. And that's what I've really taken that, that you're doing an outstanding job of. Any closing thoughts for us today? No, just be genuine. And if you make a mistake, own it. Like, hey, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, but I'm going to do everything I can to fix it. Well, outstanding. Yeah. Well, Deanna, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today on the Virginia is for Realtors podcast. I look forward to working with you down the road and I hope that you have a great year coming up. Thank you, Tanner. You too. Thank you for the opportunity. You have a great day.